know everything. <laughs> Humanism is one of the world's great ideas, which has dawned slowly over eons, and especially in the West, is an idea starkly contrasted with Western theism. It is a great idea, a bold idea, a courageous idea, an idea which has been opposed and reviled, but which has repeatedly captured the imagination of a few brave and independent thinkers, including many within Unitarian Universalism. Humanism is, as the name implies, a worldview centered in one way or the other on the human being. Buddhism as a whole is a humanistic religion. Renaissance humanism developed an educational curriculum which formed men not primarily by the study of doctrines about God, but by the study of human poetry, literature, philosophy, logic, and rhetoric, much from pre-Christian sources thus preparing generations of leaders during the Renaissance to think more openly about the world and society paving the way for the world we live in today. Enlightenment humanism in France in the 18th century spoke of the general love of humanity, a virtue hitherto quite nameless amongst us. What a thought, eh? That the love of humanity is a nameless virtue and which we will venture to call humanism, for the time has come to create a world, word for such a beautiful and necessary thing. There is a Christian humanism which, while orthodox in its beliefs, places its focus on this life and human well-being within it, following Jesus' teaching, whatever you have done for these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you have done for me. Our partner in our ESL program, Catholic Charities, is acting out of this humanistic impulse when they seek to help non-English speakers learn what they need to learn to live a better life in this country and to help us do the same. American humanism began, it's usually said, with Thomas Paine's pamphlet, The Age of Reason. And it set thoughtful people to imagining a philosophy of life which focused on human good and on this life without taking a stand on other aspects of philosophy or religion such as God or the afterlife, which they sensibly pointed out we don't know that much about. These humanists tend to see their faith as the pinnacle of religious progress from superstition through dogma through a reliance on the logical mind and the blessings of science. They believe that people could be educated into goodness and that societies engineered into peace and plenty if only we could avoid indoctrinating vulnerable children into less healthy beliefs. There is an American Humanist Association which promotes this philosophy of life but the largest institutional expression of humanism happened in the last century within Unitarian Universalist churches in America. Our denomination, while non-creedal and always allowing people to join whatever their beliefs, was in most places during the middle and late years of the last century de facto humanist in its expression for many decades. We are more diverse now. Last week, Miriam Renault, in her sermon, said that she grew up in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a lay-led congregation in the Midwest, and she was, had been taught, not to say indoctrinated, in the faith of secular humanism. I was, too, so I knew exactly what she was talking about. I grew up in a ministerially-led UU congregation in Washington, D.C. We were taught along the lines of the Jingle Bells song, to revere nature, to use logic, to seek knowledge, and to extend our helping hands to those around us. Miriam called this secular humanism, a humanism which is exclusively focused on this life and which excludes the possibility of a spiritual realm, God, other, the afterlife, and other constructs that do not fall into the realm of logic and science. For secular humanists, the highest is not anything supernatural, but is simply human beings. The human spirit, our astounding capabilities, potentials, 
the beauty of our art, the vast knowledge of our science, and the need to work together to make this a world in which every human being can develop and contribute to this greater good. Secular humanists tend to be very practical. They don't dream or pray about the dignity of persons or the value of this present life. They roll up their sleeves and get to work. They tend to believe that secular humanism is the philosophy most in tune with modern science. And when they're not feeling mellow, they are, that they are self-evidently right. Most secular humanists were born before World War II. And unlike any other religious group that I know of, have a very high proportion of men. Miriam called herself a religious humanist. She didn't elaborate on that. But what that usually means is that while one's focus is on the human and on this life, one's guesses about the nature of things do not include a traditional God or afterlife, one is still keeping an open mind and heart for, the, for spiritual experience, for wonder, for intuition, and for the guesses and beliefs of most of the world's people over the ages. Religious humanists tend to be open to the possibility that the whole truth about the universe we live in includes some kind of spiritual dimension. They tend to be a little more comfortable existing within a pluralistic religious environment. Lately, another brand of humanism has emerged called humanistic naturalism. In that philosophy, humanistic is a modifier of naturalism. One of the major criticisms of secular humanism developed late in the last century was that it placed hum the human on top of the scheme of things and neglected to notice that we humans live in a web of creation, an ecology of life and even consciousness, and that our overweening pride in our human accomplishments is downright dangerous both to us and to nature as a whole. The emphasis of humanistic naturalism, therefore, is on the human as one part of nature and its connections. Humanistic naturalism, in other words, takes humanity off the pinnacle of the cosmos and plunks us into the circle of life that is nourished by a healthy planet. Humanistic naturalism values both head and heart and includes a language of reverence a willingness to speak to the emotional side of our being, and often speaks of the story of evolution in epic, almost mythic terms, as a celebration of a creativity larger than we could ever understand, which has brought us up from the primordial soup and of which we partake in all of our lives. Naturalistic humanism uh, intends to be in tune with the insights of 20th century physics, which, as you know, often seem to have an almost mystical glaze. Humanistic naturalists find the fact that even our science is shot through with mystery suggest to them that the watchwords of humanistic naturalism be both reason and reverence. The main proponent of this 21st century humanism is William R. Murray, whose book, Reason and Reverence, Religion, Religious Humanism for the 21st Century, has been studied all over the country by UUs interested in this topic, including a group who worked through it here in Albuquerque last spring. Murray writes this. Humanistic religious naturalism promotes an ethical life in which one thinks and acts from a larger perspective than one's own egotistic interests, a life that affirms the worth and dignity of each person, a life filled with wonder and reverence for the extraordinary magnificence of the natural world and human creations. It includes gratitude for the gift of life itself and the capacity to enjoy it. To be fully human is to develop and use our minds, but not neglect our emotions and our intuitions. To me, this is still Murray speaking, to me, it is a religious responsibility and a joyful challenge to learn all I can about human beings and the world in which we live and to think critically and constructively about what I can learn. But we are also emotional beings who need to use our feelings in the service of the best that we know. A fully human person has both an open mind and a warm heart as well as a social conscience. Can you say it in Swahili? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
By the way, the, uh, the group that studied Murray's book is planning to continue as a chapter of the UU Humanists, that's spelled H-U-U-M-A-N-I-S-T-S. -E uh, they'll be meeting the second Tuesday of the month starting in December, so you can watch for more information if you're interested in that. We're always glad, and, and there's a flyer around, and Roy over here, raise your hand, Roy, he's going to lead that group. He has some more flyers. If you're interested, you can pick one up from him. Uh, we are very glad in this theologically diverse congregation to have opportunities for groups of mi like-minded people to gather to go deeper into their particular slice of the theological pie. We've had Buddhist groups and Bible groups and pagan groups. Humanists are a very welcome addition to that. Younger generations, for reasons I don't completely understand, have mostly given up on humanism. They call themselves atheists. They have their famous authors in their rousing conferences. They are also a predominantly masculine group. I'm sort of sorry to see this turn of language. Atheism as a word is a negative. It means I don't believe in God. But it doesn't say anything positive about what one does believe. Humanism is more positive. It means I'm focused on human good, human potential, this life, these people. Perhaps because I still have a soft spot in my heart for my own humanist upbringing, I'm rooting for a renaissance of humanism. And there is a way in which virtually all you use, no matter what their other beliefs, are humanists. Like our friends at Catholic Charities, we believe what we believe, but we are focused on this life. Our friend Henry David Thoreau named this well. He was dying and knew it when a friend asked him eagerly if he could see the farther shore yet. Thoreau opened one eye and said, one world at a time. <laughs> so pagan humanists believe in a living earth and the spirits it emanates, but they focus their attention on how human beings best live in this living world. Many of those of us who believe in God think that the best way to honor God and find God in this life is through service to humanity. No matter what our theologies, we you use are just not much focused on our prayer life or the next life. But some of us are just plain humanists. The growing nobility of humanity is what is highest and deepest for us. What's the humanist way of life? How does a humanist live? What do they worship? What are humanist practices of faith? What is someone who believes that what is highest in the universe is both deepest within themselves and in those around them, that unique and amazing spark of humanity, do to cultivate and express and acknowledge that holy thing? Well, they make the world a better place. They save the children. They end discrimination against whomever. You can make a case that discrimination is sacrilege to a humanist. It's denying another human being opportunity or rights because of some mere trait, skin color or sex or gender expression or family, and neglecting the astounding sacred fact that they are human, the highest and best of which the natural forces of this universe have managed to come up with in six billion years. You don't like Italians, humanists say, get a life. Open your eyes. This is a person. There is nothing more sacred. Humanist spiritual practice is heavy in service and advocacy. If you believe that the human being is the highest form of good in our universe, you'll be offended by substandard schools by ecological conditions that cause ill health, by a government that leaves its citizens languishing in trailers for two years after a hurricane. But you won't just gird up your loins and set about your chosen project with grim determination, as if it were a chore that had to be done. No, you'll do your chosen project with a certain joy and confidence and curiosity. These are human beings you are serving and meeting and helping and even opposing. The highest and best the universe has produced in six billion years. For humanists who are not too literalistic, service is our prayer is a poetic statement of their faith. Humanism blesses the world of make the, the work of making the world a better place for all people. 
And when we remember that we are doing what we're doing for the deepest of reasons, we're more likely to be able to work year after year with no end in sight, but with joy and vigor. We need to regularly remind ourselves of why we're doing what we're doing. That's one of the things we get from coming to church. And when we say we believe in love and compassion and community and are recharged for this horizontal part of our spiritual practice, which is extending that love and compassion and community, as well as justice and opportunity and learning to all people. But humanists also worship. As the great poet of UU Humanism, Kenneth Patton, said, we worship with our eyes and our ears and our fingertips. This is reading number 437 in your hymnal. Why don't you get it out and read it with me? 437. You read the italics, see them? Let us worship with our eyes and ears and fingertips. We feed our eyes upon the mystery and revelation in the faces of our brothers and sisters. We seek to understand the shyness behind arrogance, the fear behind pride, the tenderness behind clumsy strength, the anguish behind cruelty. Let us worship, not in bowing down, not with closed eyes and stopped ears. Life comes with singing and laughter, with tears and confiding, with a rising wave too great to be held in the mind and heart and body to those who have fallen in love with life. Let us worship and let us learn to love. We can all buy into that. And if you're intrigued with this idea called humanism, I hope you'll join this new discussion group meeting the second Tuesday of December and later and delve deeper into it.